Today, uh, we're excited to have Meg Harris. She is the first Spartan Upcycle by Art Lab resident artist. She's a, from Detroit area, and she is what uh, she identifies as a materialist. And we'll hear more about that um, in just a moment. So I want to say thank you all for uh, coming today to the MSU Surplus Storm Recycling Center Town Hall. This is a special um, edition focused on um, Spartan Upcycle, which is the creative reuse, retail, and education branch of uh, the Surplus Storm Recycling Center. And we have essentially um, formed out of a recognition that there's a higher and better use for a lot of the materials that we were um, recycling or even um, you know, tossing out. So uh, Spartan Upcycle is in response to that. And this residency really supports MSU Surplus Storm Recycling Center's mission to manage our waste as a resource through an integrated system of uh, reuse, recycling, collaboration, and education. So each year, uh, Surplus Store and Recycling Center, we process between 20 and 25 million pounds of material, uh, including what we collect from campus and at our public recycling drop-off center. Uh, so we have items including um, surplus goods that departments will donate to us, electronics, um, things that are donated by the MSU community through our community reuse program, we also receive all of the recycling that's generated on campus, as well as our food waste um, and our trash. Um, so with Megan as the artisan residence, um, it was really a great opportunity to see the way that she was um, intrigued by our materials in a completely different way than, um, at least for myself, uh, that I expected. And I think for many of us that we expected. And so um, we're going to hear from her today about her work. Um, the photo that you see on the screen here is um, Meg's studio in process uh, at the art lab. So for eight weeks, um, she spent time working at the art lab, um, which is located right across from the Broad Art Museum on the weekends, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and then she has um, quickly built this um, exhibit, which is now on display at the art lab through January 23rd. It's titled Never Not Nature. And I think you'll get a good sense of uh, why she calls it that as we go uh, forward here. So with Matt, with that, I'll pass it on to Meg. Awesome, thank you so much, Katie. And um, again, a huge shout out to um, uh, Spartan Surplus Center and all of Katie's work. She's a great partner. Also to um, Britta at the Art Lab and all of the um, Broad employees and also Spartan Surplus employees. Um, as well as the Graduate Hotel who put me, put me up during this time. So a lot of different parties involved in helping to make this really cool experience happen. Um, so I am going to advance these slides if I can, hold on. Oh, there we go. Um, so like Katie said, my name is Meg. I'm based in Detroit, Michigan. Um, I have a studio here and have been in Detroit for about 15 years. Um, I'm uh, originally a Michigander, born and raised here, but spent some time traveling around. So I'm going to talk to you about sort of what drives my work and what Katie said is um, I describe myself as a materialist. Um, the reason I do that is because I really, um, as people will ask, are you a painter? Are you a sculptor? I, I feel like I've, I do a lot of different processes and use a lot of different mediums, but what I really am interested in is material and how it um, responds and functions in the world. And that helps me understand the world in a, in a bigger, deeper, broader way and helps me connect with people. And so given that the Spartan Surplus Center, what they do is basically process material. It was a really a beautiful connection there um, to really dive into material materiality. Um, if you look at my website, you'll see there's a pretty a broad swath of work that sometimes seems in, um, like not related. Um, but I really, throughout the years, have found that there's really specific themes that weave through all my work, no matter what the sort of physical or visual manifestation of that work might be. And so the themes, I'm going to talk through each of those themes um, and talk about works that are related to that. Uh, so material, time, failure, and participation are all really important themes that thread through my work, no matter if it's a collage, if it's a large scale installation, if it's some weird little sculpture, um, those are all really important themes. I'm gonna walk through those. Another important thing is that I, what I really love to do with these conversations is talk to folks about the artists that really inspire me and that drive the work. Um, and they're sort of, for me, is like a, a bellwether um, thinking about my work. Is it 
because I, I really respect these artists and respect the way that they're working, is my, how's my work related to that? Am I, am I reaching that sort of that bellwether? Am I, am I doing what I want to be doing with the work I'm making? And it also provides just some art education for, for you all. And I think that's really important to be able to learn more about art and art world because I'm my, a lot of my practice is embedded in art education and that's near and dear to my heart. So the first person that we're gonna talk about, the first theme we're gonna talk about is material. And an artist that I really respect and look up to um, and just am fascinated by her work is Anne Hamilton. Uh, she is based in um, Ohio. So she's also a Midwestern artist, um, but also is internationally known. She's, she has a lot of notoriety. Um, it's kind of a big deal. Um, so Anne Hamilton, I really love the way that she works with material and, and how she works with material in place. She, she creates work in really kind of um, important historical spaces and uses material to reflect uh, how the history of those places, the depth of those places. And um, so I'm gonna talk through this piece. It's called Indigo Blue. This was in Charleston, South Carolina. And when she first arrived on site, they said, oh, this is an old auto um, repair store. And upon further investigation, um, she learned a lot more about it. And so what you see here is this large plinth with um, a bunch of cotton um, attire, cotton uniforms that um, the auto, auto uh, workers would wear. Um, and just the weight and the smell, they smell like oil, they've got stains, they're used, right? So you can smell, almost smell somebody's, the essence of somebody's body. So there's the weight of those, um, just talking about labor and, and just sort of what it is to work in a space like that. And then also what she learned was that this space had been um, a place where cotton had been sold and distributed and processed, um, which was part of the slave trade in, in the United States. And also this had been a space where slaves were bought and sold. Um, and so what you see here is, so these, these shirts are cotton, they're dyed with indigo, which relate to that space and that place and that the cotton industry. And what you see here is, a, is an actor. And what he's doing is this is a, um, a registry of all the, the people that were bought and sold. And he's basically erasing those names. So that sense of erasure that's happening and, and what does it mean in terms of our legacy in, in the United States. And so, you know, this when you first walk into this exhibition, you're like, oh, there's just a pile of cloth and there's a guy sitting there erasing stuff. But when you really start to spend some time in the space and feel the weight, hear that erasure, smell that smell, it really envelops you in the history of this space in a really deep and I think visceral way. So I'm really interested in how material can feel visceral and can feel real and you can feel more of a part of it. So this is a work from um, the exhibition called Never Not Nature. It's called Making Rainbows. So this is a brand new piece. Um, and what you're looking at here is is about 50 concrete blocks that are about 16 inches wide, eight inches deep. And there's about 50 of them uh, that are stacked up. And in between each block is paper pulp. The concrete um, blocks came from Spartan Surplus as well as the, the, the ingredients to make the paper pulp. I'm gonna flip to the next slide so you can kind of see how this was made. Uh, so this is all recycled pulp that I made from paper, paper scraps from Spartan Surplus. These are the concrete blocks that I'm hand drilling here. And then this is how the piece was built. Why that's important to me is because um, thinking about material, this, this piece basically is in the act of its making over the course of the exhibition. So what makes paper paper is pressure and time. And so what you see here is, is these concrete blocks that are basically pressing on that paper and the piece is shifting and changing over the time of the exhibition. And so you're really seeing material in action as the viewer. Um, and to me, I love creating sculptures that make themselves. So it's it, whenever a viewer shows up and comes to an exhibition, there's something different that is potentially happening. So you are a participant in that, in that process. Um, so I'm gonna flip forward. I don't, Katie, if you want to say a few words about, about this piece. 
Yeah, sure. Um, so I think what was a great um, piece of having Meg as a resident artist here um, was that she was active in collecting the materials um, as they were available. And so um, in one instance, Meg was, you know, looking for obviously uh, pulp or paper to make uh, new pulp with for the paper making process. And I believe that at this time, um, you know, she had already had this concept in mind, I think with the, um, the rainbow. Um, but uh, it was interesting because we went into the materials recovery facility, which is where we process all of the recyclables here. And we went to the paper uh, bunker, which is, you know, a conglomeration of mixed paper. So it could be food packaging, you know, office paper. Uh, it, it depends on what's there. And what we found was uh, this one stack um, of a bunch of yellow paper um, that you can see above. And then also some of these uh, like fruit, uh, trays, you know, that are more of that, um, almost like an egg carton material, kind of that real fibrous uh, uh, te uh, texture. And Meg was really, um, you know, letting me know about the difference of the paper and the way that it affects the paper making process, which really has a lot to do with understanding the process of recycling in general. And the fact that, you know, as things um, are, are reworked over and over again, you know, those, um, those bonds, uh, in this case, the fiber, um, cellulose, you know, it would be breaking down over time. And so what Meg was talking about was, I think, Meg, correct me if I'm wrong, but that bottom uh, one with that egg cart, that that fruit tray, that was something that was going to give you a different um, consistency. But in fact, it was a surprise that it worked out really well, even though it was kind of that, you know, um, uh, it had gone through a couple cycles already. No, that's that's totally that's totally correct. And I think that sort of lends itself to the next work that I can talk about because, um, you know, as an artist, I'm really interested in science um, and 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 how things are made. Again, this goes back to, to material. And so what, what Katie was mentioning was this um, idea of cellulose. And so this piece is called the cellulose circle. And what you're looking at here is, is a bunch of cardboard tubes that are sort of attached together using pulp, using recycled pulp. So using recycled paper. And what um, Katie was mentioning, this, this idea of cellulose. And so, um, and so what I'm looking at, I have created sort of like a, a cellulose wall. So what makes paper paper is cellulose and its strength. And, and that's, you know, that's what we get from our plants. As paper gets recycled, uh, and most of the paper that we all deal with, like this, you know, this kind of computer printer paper is, um, has been recycled. And so it really weakens those cellulose bonds. And so when you work with recycled paper, um, you have less, less strength. And so this piece was really an experiment to see how strong is this recycled paper? How is it gonna hold up? How is it gonna hold these things together? And so um, that's what I, I really loved about, this piece is definitely an experimentation in materiality. And so, and also thinking about, yeah, again, the life cycle of a tree. So these are reused cardboard tubes um, that are derived from a, a plant. This is recycled paper that is also derived from a plant. And I'm um, and inside of each of these, um, these sort of forms, you can see there's, there's light. Um, so they, they have a sense of, of movement. Um, and then there's these little vials that have um, bits of trash, they've got seeds. Because as I was at MSU, I was, I was going on, on walks and, um, and collecting plant parts and things like that. And really fascinated by looking at those and the images of them. And so, those also have become part of this piece, as well as in a conversation with, with um, Katie at, at Surplus, um, at the Resource Recovery, is plastic film is really um, something that's, that's hard to find a market for and it's hard to recycle. And so what I was playing with, again, was how can I make that part of the piece? And so I, mo this is mostly water bottle trash that I, um, placed over these and then shrink wrapped it and they become almost like windows um, into the piece and, and create a sense of light. Um, and most of them, and, and again, there's, it's kind of funny, like this one, you can see there's a forest behind there. I think some of the imagery that we see on these things um, that are talk about nature and, and how, you know, water is wellness, but in fact, they're sort of um, contaminating the waste stream with this, this plastic film is kind of ironic. So 
uh, when I'm thinking about the materials I'm using, I'm really conscientious about their, what is their, um, what are they saying? Um, what are they saying about us, you know, our culture, our society, that kind of thing. Um, Katie, I don't know if you have anything else to add here in terms of. Yeah, sure. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mute myself. I apologize. Um, yeah, I think what was cool is that Meg was able to utilize the plastic from our materials recovery facility that was placed in our recycling bins uh, incorrectly. So right now we only accept plastic bottles and tubs. And so the plastic film we suggest goes to the uh, grocery stores like Kroger and Meyer for recycling um, that way, which will then become turned into a, likely a Trex type of um, you know, artificial wood material. Um, so it's difficult for us to, to, to market here. So what was great was to see that Meg was able to incorporate a material that was truly going to be landfilled, um, you know, into something that, you know, just, I mean, to me really, you know, I think that it just kind of knocked my socks off. I really like that piece. I like the light behind it. I like the little nooks and crannies that, you know, are, are hidden within those slices of the carpet tubes. And, you know, carpet tubes are something that we tend to get a lot of. Um, once, um, you know, students move in, we, um, into campus, we see a increase in uh, carpet tubes, um, you know, coming onto the recycling center floor. So um, we also get a lot of them at our public recycling drop-off uh, center. Apparently there's, a, you know, a, maybe a company or so, maybe a couple that, um, you know, do this and then utilize us to recycle the tubes, which is, you know, a great way to avoid sending them to the landfill. And uh, so we had, you know, material recovery facility staff, um, you know, a few people, um, you know, Sean, Rob, Reg primarily were, um, you know, pulling these things aside. And then, you know, we were able to work with some of our material um, recovery facility staff. Um, I think it was Jeff who showed us how, you know, to use a certain tool that we'd be able to, you know, um, clamp it into the vise and then saw those bits out for Meg um, just to kind of give it a test to see what would work and then cut them down into a size that would fit in the car because they were quite long. So, you know, I liked how Meg wanted to choose the particular ones. And that's what I think is pretty interesting is that the, the material, you know, it wasn't just, oh, this is a carpet tube. It was like she wanted this particular carpet tube because she saw the potential in that piece. So. And then, yeah, and the next and the other photo is just um, her um, is Meg, you know, in the studio at the art lab in the midst of making, um, you know, those um, the uh, I forget the name of the piece, the um, yeah, cellulose, cellulose circle, yeah, just cellulose circles. Them. Right. And this yeah. was a great opportunity for uh, the students to to, you know, see this process in paper. So or in um, the, pr the process of paper making. The art lab studio has been open um, for the days that Meg was there, uh, Friday through Saturday from 12 to 6, and um, no longer now that the installation is up, but when she was creating. And so students would drop into the art lab either for um, attending a Spartan Upcycle Friday event or to just check out the other exhibit in the back gallery or, you know, explore what they have for sale in the um, shopping area. And then they just stumbled back here and it was great that Meg was there to engage them and talk to them about the plants that, you know, she used. She had them all laid out in these different plastic bags to really indicate the way that, like you said, the life cycle of a, of a tree and what it uh, then can become for us. And I thought it was a great way to, you know, bring this residency to um, the students. Cool. Agreed. And I was actually impressed there was a lot, there was not only students, but community members, professors, um, you know, people that worked around there. It was really, it was really a great way to engage um, with folks, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so, um, so the next thing, so we just finished up material. So time, time is such an important part of my process. And time is something that I think about um, just as a human. Um, I think we, we have the, these cultural and social concepts of time and and I think um, it's constructed, right? And, and so as an artist, that's something I've always really um, thought a lot about because when I'm in the studio, I have to really kind of uh, release my sense of time um, so that I can work and so I can get embedded in, in my practice instead of you know, looking at my phone and being like checking the time, you know, being able to kind of get lost in the process. And so I have, and you could look on my website, I have a series of, of works where I create these almost studio clocks that, that keep a sense of time for me, but it's a sense of 
art time, the sense a different sense of time than than what we experience in the real world. And so this piece, I love this piece. This is an artist named Tim Hawkinson. Um, and it's called Spin Sync. I'm gonna describe what's going on. I wish there was a video of this piece, but there isn't one. So feel free to explore it on your own. But basically what you see is a bunch of discs that basically are like cogs and they're creating you know, movement. This little one spins, causes the next one to spin, causes the next one to spin. But what, you're, what I love about this piece is it's a physical representation. Um, you're watching time happen. So this little, um, the first little uh, thing that's spinning is spinning at 1600 RPMs per minute, which your eyeball cannot perceive. It's spinning incredibly fast. And then it's causing the rest of these ones to spin, 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 spin. And you get to this last one. And this, this piece takes a hundred years to make a rotation. So this is a century that's represented in this last disc. I love this, this the sense that he can compress time in, in a mere sculpture, right, uh, in, a, in, in a physical sense. And it really, I think for me, asks a lot of questions about what's the physicality of time? What is our mental attachment to time? And, um, and just a really, I think, a fun and uh, engaging piece in that way. And I also love that he uses really mundane or materials that all of us can recognize, right? Um, these are stuff that you could get at Home Depot, or maybe he recycled it, I'm not sure. But um, I think a really interesting artist in terms of, of thinking about time. Um, so the way that I really think about time, I already mentioned a little bit, but in, in the um, exhibition itself, this is a piece called After the Flood. And I worked a lot with, I worked a lot with plants and I work a lot with unwanted plants. So all the plants you see in the exhibition are ones that I dragged out of the landscaping pile. Um, so basically there's this pile kind of behind the, um, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly sure the area, but I would just go in there and, and find, find branches. And what I was really interested in was creating a forest inside of, inside of a building. And so for me, when I go into a forest, there's a sense of timelessness. Um, and also thinking about how old trees are, like how much trees have seen, like some of these trees are centuries old. And like, and, and I feel like to me, when I'm in a forest, that, that sort of quiet, that sense of peace, that sense of timelessness and just like how much trees have, have witnessed. Um, and, and so there's that timelessness, that sense of forest I wanted to create because you can actually walk inside of this piece. Um, but this piece is also about um, a flood that I experienced. I don't know, some of you might know um, that there was uh, some pretty significant flooding in Detroit this summer and kind of all over Michigan and all over the world, right? Um, and uh, it really, I was, um, at my studio, I was my living space in my studio and I, I experienced that event. And that made me think a lot about time as well. Like experiencing a flood is sort of such an immediate sort of catastrophic event where your sense of time is, is sort of panic is sort of like, what do I save? What do I not save? And so um, I was really thinking deeply about that. And these, these, um, these items, these um, crystals were, were things that I actually saved from my building space. They had been part of the original building chandeliers and I had saved them and they um, were kind of getting washed away in the flood. And so I think that also that sense of time with material, these, these um, pieces, these crystals had been through a lot in terms of the building. And now I wanted them to show back up in this piece to sort of reflect the time of that building and, and my experience there. Um, so next, um, I have some video. I'm gonna just try to play it on here. If it doesn't work, we'll switch to my desktop. Um, but this is called uh, Finding Forests. And um, what you see here is basically another alive branch and um, zip tied to it are a bunch of fake plants that um, were from the uh, Barton Surplus Center. And then um, hanging it up is a bunch of um, e-waste. So cords, computer cords, um, ethernet cords, that sort of thing. And so what I'm really interested in with this piece in terms of time is sort of that sense of decay, um, what's left. So a tree is going to, a live tree is gonna fall apart. The leaves are gonna fall off. And what will be left is this fake, is this fake stuff that I've attached to it. Um, and like, what is, that uh, how long will that, those plastic tree parts be around, right? How, how and, and same thing with the e-waste, I'm really interested in, in this idea of 
we create these like immediate, these things where we can be immediately connected, but what's the real impact of those objects of that, of that culture? Um, and so thinking about the time of, of a tree and its life and the time of these things that sort of mimic a tree and their lifespan, and then also uh, the way that we try to stay connected and the lifespan of those objects. So there's a lot of time embedded in this piece. And it's also spinning. Um, when I think about time, spinning really comes comes to mind as you watch a clock, as you watch the earth spin um, as the world turns. And so there's a lot of sort of layers of time in this piece. Um, let me stop it and I'll go to the next. Uh, Katie. Uh, yeah, this um, piece speaks to uh, time here with regards to our development at MSU Surplus Storm Recycling Center. Uh, so um, what's pretty cool is that, you know, the initial artist in residence, uh, Meg, you know, is a paper maker um, primarily, and that, um, you know, MSU Recycling started off as um, a paper recycling initiative that the students um, and the board of trustees and some faculty uh, were, um, you know, in support of. And so uh, that's how we began here at Surplus and Recycling Center was just uh, recycling paper in the 80s. And uh, I just think it's uh, pretty cool that we've come such a long way that now we're able to, you know, in, involve um, the humanities and the arts through what Meg does and our other activities. Um, and then that we've expanded our, our program so much uh, to collect additional materials and then also to do some unconventional, um, you know, things like uh, construction and demolition um, sorting. So a lot of the lumber that you see in that picture there, this is out back of the Surplus Storm Recycling Center where we have the um, waste diversion yard. And so we'll um, pull uh, wood and concrete and uh, you know, maybe scrap metal from um, the dumpsters that uh, we would provide for some of the construction um, projects happening on campus. And we also get, you know, a lot of pellets because we, you know, collect those from all the loading docks that, um, you know, receive them for shipments on campus. So um, it's just, I thought, an interesting uh, connection, you know, that Meg talks about time and that we started first off with recycling um, paper. And now, you know, here we are and we, you know, pull out um, the, the wood scraps and we will also sell, you know, we sell pallets and uh, occasionally we'll do free wood Friday where we open it up and um, people come and just, you know, um, come and source the timber, uh, which I think gets into kind of our next uh, slide and uh, the theme that Meg's gonna talk about. Oops, so you're on mute. I mean, yeah, got it. <laughs> um, so yeah, failure. Failure is such an important part of being a human. <laughs> and so I really love to uh, explore that theme and think about that theme and in, in, in my work and just in my life. And so this is a piece by Usman Khan, who's a um, uh, Michigan artist based in Detroit, Ann Arbor. Just all that I'm going to talk about this piece really, really briefly. Um, it was, it's a really impactful piece for me in terms of the experience of it. So this is at MOCAD, um, Museum of Contemporary Art, Detroit. Um, Osman is a Pakistani American, Muslim American, um, and he created this really beautifully tiled pedestal um, that really reflects his culture. What would happen as you're standing in there is that this steel beam would come crashing down um, and you didn't really know why, and it would start to break apart this beautifully tiled pedestal. Uh, and it was watching that beam come down um, and smash that was such a, a sort of a violent and, and again, body sort of visceral response to it. And the way that that worked was that uh, he put on public buses and in coffee shops and just different spaces, he put a phone number and it said, sometimes I lose faith and random people would just dial the phone number. And then what would happen is this magnet would release and it would drop that steel beam. What he's referencing is IED device technology. So, you know, bombs that are used, that are set off, um, especially in place in the place where he is from. Um, and so what he's really talking about is his relationship as a Muslim American, um, the way that we think um, a more dominant culture, uh, and I'm speaking for myself as a, you know, white, white woman, um, like what, 
what we think of as Muslim culture um, and, and our, I think our failure to really understand each other. So it's both a personal response for him and also just more of a, a, a cultural, sociocultural response to like, how are, we, how are we seeing each other and how are we kind of failing each other? Um, and I like that the piece itself is sort of breaking down um, throughout the exhibition. And so I also really love to play with failure in my, in my work. And so this is a piece called um, Rhythm of Return. Um, I'll play it really quick. It's pretty simple. So basically what you're seeing is, is, is that's a machine from Spartan Surplus, it's a scientific machine. And then there's pulp in the, in the top in a, in a plexiglass um, base. And, and basically it's just tilting back and forth, pretty simple. Um, but, but what I love about this piece is that sort of on the brink of failure, like as an audience person, um, is that pulp gonna slosh over? Um, and it, it really, to me, um, talks about the sort of fragility of objects, the fragility of ourselves as humans, and just sort of that precipice that we're always kind of walking on. Um, and also just the object itself is, um, you know, I sort of rehab this machine so it would continue to work, but I'm not sure how long it's going to work. And so um, I think I love to sort of call into question, like, how, how long will objects um, serve us? Um, and, and just sort of questioning um, the art object itself. Um, the next piece, and hopefully this will, this will load, we'll see. Um, I was having issues before. Oh yeah, oops, it stopped. So basically what this, and I, I'll describe it and then pull up the video. So basically what these are, these, these are all, again, scientific instruments that I got at the, um, the, the, the store. Um, they were on the floor there, they were for sale. And most of them were in sort of different states of disrepair. And so I had to fix them. And so what you see is that there's a couple centrifuges and this this is a some sort of lab machine that shakes plants. And um, what I'm really interested in this piece, um, the sort of series is called Performing Nature, is sort of how, um, how in, in our current day with you know floods, forest fires, uh, tsunamis, I think there's this sort of understanding or this uh, thought that nature is sort of failing us. Um, mother, mother nature is coming after humans. Um, but, but what I'm sort of positing is like, I feel like we, in a lot of ways we have failed nature. And so, I've, I've, so I'm sort of forcing nature to perform in this way in these machines sort of trying to um, keep it contained and make it almost dance. Um, and so, but as these pieces age, again, they're live plants. And so they're gonna fall apart. They're gonna look different. They're gonna fail over time, right? They're gonna lose their, their pine needles as you can see right here. Um, this one's like slapping the wall. Uh, there's some fake plants here that will remain. So again, it's sort of like forcing nature to do a thing that it probably doesn't want to do. And so really calling into question our nature, um, our, our relationship with nature and like, what is our role in that? How have we, how have we failed? failed um, mother nature as much as we feel like she's failing us. So just, a um, and they're also kind of goofy. I love creating kind of, um, having these really intense conversations. This is essentially about climate change, um, but it is, uh, I think a more goofy life, lighthearted way to kind of talk about what is our responsibility? What is our role in that? Um, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna keep moving forward. Um, I'm not gonna pull up the videos on my screen, but. Uh, let's go to the next one. So Katie. Yeah. Um, so as Meg was saying, you know, what are we doing in society that is um, within our control? That's, uh, you know, a failure of um, maybe forethought or care, compassion, um, you know, who can speculate? Um, a lot of us, <laughs> we all have our opinions, but um, I, I really liked um, that, that Meg continued to come back to this um, concept of the life cycle of the tree. And, um, you know, in the case of the piece on the right, um, you can see that there was some of the fence posts, which came from um, MSU farms. 
Uh, then we also had some of the uh, timber. I know she also brought in some things from infrastructure planning and facilities uh, department of landscape services. Um, like all those branches. Um, and then though the tall, like uh, kind of reddish hue one looks like a redwood maybe, or, or something along those, I don't know, it's not a redwood, but uh, what is that one? Just, yeah, that reddish bark. Um, those are actually, um, you know, fake wood tubes that have been wrapped in vinyl that's printed with this bark on it. Um, and, we determined, um, you know, we have a staff member here who used to work at the um, MSU Museum and those came from an exhibit there. Um, and so it's uh, interesting to see the, the reuse of that. And I um, really liked the way that Meg incorporates the, the um, neon colors throughout her work. Um, I think that adds um, another playful element to what she, you know, what she shows. And um, on the left, the photo with these various, um, uh, devices, you know, Meg came in a few different times to find the correct ones, you know, the centrifuges that she used and then that little shaky um, device. And uh, I was over there, the you know, when she was trying it out and, you know, it was just apparent that it was just fun for her to kind of play with that as, um, you know, I mean, you think of it as, oh, that's so simple. You just put in some, uh, you know, faux plants and then uh, it, it, it just is there, right? You turn it on. But the beauty of it is having that imagination to see the possibility of combining these things and creating something completely new out of it. And um, while the material, while the item itself did not really change much, um, you know, I'm not sure. I think you did you add a sensor to it at the end? Yeah. Um, but it so it's showing that you know you don't have to completely disassemble something always to practice that creative reuse but you can you know just use it in a really unique different way and it's all about changing that perspective and i think that that's why creative reuse can um, do so much for us you know aside from uh the benefits that we get by you know reducing the amount of waste that we send to the landfill mm -hmm. Well, I think, Katie, you bring up a good point that I know that you and I have talked about um, in terms of uh, materiality and, and what I'm really interested in. And, and just like these, so these are just Home Depot ratchet straps, right? And I'm, I'm really interested in using um, objects that are familiar to people and objects that people can feel. And I don't, I don't, I like to play with them and, and put them in a new context, but I don't totally dismantle them and transform them into something brand new. Um, because I'm real, I think when people can see those objects and relate to them, and and to me it feels um, I'm really interested in making work that's accessible and that people can be like, oh, I could see myself creating something like that. Or so it feels it makes it. I don't. I'm not trying to trick, trick anybody. I'm trying to sort of bring people into the work and and make it feel uh, relational and feel familiar, um, but it, in a way that is yeah, kind of goofy or silly or artistic or you know. Um, and so I like a little bit of mystery. Um, but also I think that familiarity um, brings people in in a, in a nice way. Yeah, and I like that you mentioned that um, just uh, in reference to another piece of Spartan Upcycle and um, the Broad Art Lab partnership is our Spartan Upcycle Fridays that we host um, every Friday and every month is a new project. It's a drop-in activity that happens on Fridays from noon to 6 p.m. at the Art Lab. And, um, you know, Meg made me think of it because of, the way that you mentioned, you know, keeping items that are familiar, but yet, you know, making them, you know, present differently. Um, this month, uh, so tomorrow, our um, materials are our scrap metal pieces. So we're making these metallic uh, votives, you know, bringing some light into these darkening days. And, you know, we have a lot of bottle caps and, you know, uh, mason jar lids, you know, we have some film reel canisters. And so it's just, it's interesting to see the way that um, the students or community members who are coming to these projects, um, you know, are working with materials that are, like you said, familiar to them, you know, everyone can identify a bottle cap, but they see it in a different way. Um, likewise, you know, one thing that I thought was a, a great project was our uh, macrame plant hangers. And these were made with um, cords that were electronic waste um, received from the surplus store. Um, we get these occasionally. This um, is a fiber optic one. And so um, Britta, the studio educator and the curator of um, Meg's um, exhibit, um, you know, came up with this um, model for how to, you know, create this to hold the plant in. And then you can just see the different ways that, 
once you explore the material, you know, here we are, this is the inside of the, of the fiber optic cable. And, um, you know, I think that that's one thing that I picked up in, um, you know, getting a chance to work with Meg. And I think the students who got to interact with her, you know, through the, um, the class about um, changing the world, um, it was an ISS course, you know, seeing uh, the way that you can um, really just shift your perspective entirely by just doing a little bit of a, a play. Cool. Oh, sorry, moving forward, guys. All right, and I wanna wrap this up pretty quickly because I wanna have some time. Um, so uh, the, last, the last sort of theme that we're gonna to touch on is participation. Um, I'm, for me, participation is so key um, to making art. Uh, and that's why this, this opportunity was so great because basically participation was embedded in it. So this is an artist, Fiesta Gates, and I would really encourage folks to check out his work. He's based in Chicago and does a lot of work in the South side of Chicago. And um, a lot of his work, a lot of his projects, this is just one project that was at a museum um, where he basically took um, a hardware store from the south, south side of Chicago and recreated it in a gallery um, and really made it an object, made it beautiful, um, but sort of bringing people that are, this is in Milan, bringing people that are in Milan into a space that feels um, like the memory, the history, the objects of uh, his, where he's from, right? Uh, but he has a ton of other projects that really engage people in a participatory way um, in, in sort of creating opportunities for other artists. Uh, and, and so I would definitely check out his work. And he's, for me, is a, again, like a bellwether for like, what is participation? What does it mean? How are people engaged in, a, in, a, in an authentic way? Um, because I think there's lots of different levels of participation for people. Um, and especially for me as a, um, I'm a white artist in a black city in Detroit. And so for me to engage authentically and mindfully um, with my community is so key to my process. And I've done that in a lot of different places in the, the United States and, and again at, at MSU. Because um, for me, art is about having a conversation. Art is about um, understanding one another, understanding the world. And so if people don't feel like they can participate in it, then, then it, I think it, it creates a barrier um, for entry. So. The way that I have um, really engaged in participation is, and I think I'm going to have to um, pull up the actual video here, so bear with me. One second, here we go. So basically what you're seeing here is the invasive paper project, which is a project that I've um, been uh, hosting that I've invented. It's been around for about eight years. Um, so basically what happens is people, and again, it goes back to unwanted, unwanted material. So, so using unwanted plant material, um, turning it into paper and then hosting uh, collaborative workshops with folks so that they can learn about the paper making process. Um, the way that this is really collaborative and participatory is that I've done it in, in multiple sort of places in the United States. And, um, and I don't know what plants are problematic for folks. Um, and so I don't, and I don't wanna assume that I know. And so I work in collaboration with organizations, with neighborhoods, with people. And we have this conversation about what, what plants um, and what, what landscapes are people challenged with. And so then they teach me um, about the plants and the landscapes that they're living in. And in exchange, I, I teach paper making. And so for me, it's a, it feels um, like an equal sort of authentic way to engage with people in these sort of the shared learning. And through that process, we really talk through, okay, what are some ways that we can kind of think about invasive plants or unwanted plants in a different way? Are there, other than making paper, can we create brooms from it? Can we make a, a, a structure from it? And so it really sort of opens up conversations about how people think about resources, um, think about landscapes, think about their own communities. And so that's the goal of, of the project. Um, let me open this back up here. Um, okay. And so with participation, um, 
at MSU, I mean, that was such a key part of it, like I mentioned. Um, and I'm gonna go to the next slide here. Um, uh, so yeah, participation was super important. So I think um, I think one example, and Katie mentioned quite a bit, I was interacting, um, I was interacting with all sorts of people throughout this, um, the arborist, folks at Spartan Surplus, professors from forestry, uh, students from packaging. So it really was a robust way for me to be in there literally making on site and sort of conceiving of this thing over the eight weeks, people could get in involved in the process of the making. And so um, when we had the opening, um, th these are this is a piece that um, I call desk rainbows. They basically are some lab, um, it's lab equipment, that pipette equipment, and then just wire. And I made these sort of rainbows and they're sort of silly and cute and also joyful. Um, wanted people, you know, thinking about this whole Zoom environment, if we each had a desk rainbow next to us, maybe that could bring some joy in this really virtual space. And so during the opening, what we did was, uh, it's a really simple thing to make. And so people at the opening were able to make their own desk rainbows, um, which is really fun to see because there was also within the opening this really participatory kind of um, sharing that was happening. And it was really fun to see the ways in which people interacted in different ways um, with the material and made their own very own desk rainbow that they could take home with themselves. Uh, and so I'm gonna pass it over to, to Katie to talk to talk more about participation and then would love to hear any questions folks have. Yeah, sure. So um, uh, just to follow up on the desk rainbows, um, this was one that um, was made by um, uh, a friend and coworker here. Um, so you can tell um, that what it was is a pipette tip box. You can see the, all those little holes, and then this is the base, and then it would have a clear lid on the top. And the the way that this came to be was out of participating with um, you know a, a member of the academic community here who's a faculty um, who reached out to us saying, hey, I know there's some plastic changes and you can't recycle these what in the heck can I do with them? Because we receive so many of them. Um, they go through you know, hundreds or thousands of, the, of these across the labs on campus. And um, a lot of them were the mint green color. And so I sent it over to um, Megan Britta and said, hey, do you guys think this is something you could work with? And uh, they said, yeah, sure. And you know, I just, I think it's so great that Meg was able to come up with this concept of the desk rainbow. And um, yeah, we had a lot of, um, a lot of people having a good time just kind of chatting and nothing too high stakes with that. Um, so uh, also participation in this um, residency came through, um, you know, just collection of the materials. So, you know, helping um, Meg to understand the source of the materials and also helping, you know, our staff to understand the way in which they can be reconfigured. Um, so the picture at the bottom, it, not just our staff, but, you know, in general, but in this instance, um, we have, you know, Meg in the uh, bottom picture talking with Sean and Reg in our material recovery facility when she came to pick up some plastic and some carpet tubes and just, you know, get a tour of what we do here. Um, so, you know, I think it's um, one way to bring education, uh, to, to encourage people to come and visit our facility is through this, um, this lens of, hey, look at all this potential laying around here. Like, you know, we talk about it as waste and we're lucky that, you know, not lucky, but uh, you know, we're, we're, we're grateful that we have the resource to, you know, recycle this material um, because it is labor intensive. It, it costs, you know, money to run the machines, takes a lot of people. Um, in the back, you see cardboard, and that is one of our, um, you know, good um, commodities that we're able to receive, you know, good revenue on. But in any case, um, we had participation in that end. Also, um, Meg being at the um, Spartan Upcycle Fridays when she was there, you know, working on her um, exhibition. The top picture is, is her talking with a student um, during the junk journal making um, uh, event, which was the month of September. Um, that student chose to use a um, Monopoly board. And um, that concept came from a coworker here who works in Surplus um, and on Upcycle, um, Annie. And then, um, you know, lastly, just I think it's important to think about um, how Meg's work, uh, or I shouldn't say it's important to, but what made me um, 
Meg's work made me think about the way that it affects that our choices today affect the next generation. And I just loved this photo that was, um, you know, courtesy of Britta, um, who took this of, you know, of people just enjoying this art that is uh, made from things that, you know, otherwise um, might not have had a home, you know, it's possible that we would have, you know, been able to sell the faux plants. Um, this, the centrifuge, I'm not sure how well those sell. Um, you know, sometimes if they don't work, um, you know, it, it can be a challenge, but we did have a testing station and I know Meg had some challenges with that. So just the participation aspect of the art making through this um, was really great. And um, I mean, I think that we had a lot of support from the collections crew here at um, the Surplus Storm Recycling Center in terms of moving some of these really heavy objects. You know, we had pallets of those cement um, concrete bricks that cost or that weighed, you know, a thousand pounds or so that we had to split into two so that we didn't, you know, damage the floor and in going into the road. So um, I think that uh, Meg did a great job of in, of being open to, you know, involving our staff and and um, as well as the community that you know is um, really the purpose uh, why why we're all here for MSU. Awesome, thank you, Katie. Um, I think we do we have a, so we have a few minutes for some questions or comments um, or you know if I need to provide more information I always put this so I, I don't always show a ton of images because like everybody kind of knows how to use the internet. Um, so that's my website there if you want to look at more of my work or follow me on Instagram, um, but also just happy to have conversation, um, we have a few minutes left so any questions we'd love to chat through. Feel free to um, drop them in the chat or put them in the Q&A or um, you can raise your hand and unmute. Let's see if we have anything coming in so far. Okay, um, we've got one uh, from Facebook. So uh, uh, let's see, Meg, I'm wondering what what was the way that you were able to, um, you know, prepare for this, um, for this uh, uh, residency? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, it was a really, it was a real challenge, um, honestly, because I, um, I am a really, I'm a responsive maker. Like I, I get the thing and I, you know, uh, think about it. But the challenge that I really had was it was a short amount of time to sort of um, conceive of a material and turn a sort of an exhibition around that made sense, that felt cohesive. That and and so the the initial thing is like, oh, I'm just gonna start making stuff and crossing stuff off a list because I know I have this thing that's gonna open. Um, on October 15th. Um, so I worked really hard to allow myself time to play and really engage and, and invest in the material and understand how it was working. And so, um, you know, I had to be strategic about like allowing myself that time to explore and to play, um, but then also strategic about, okay, this is time for me to make some decisions about what I'm moving forward with and what's working and what isn't. And so, um, and I honestly think that um, that prep that comes from doing this for many years um, and also knowing what the pitfalls are. And so, um, so I, there, there definitely were things like the concrete piece, or I knew I wanted to have live plants in there, but like, I really didn't know. Um, there was some stuff in there that really surprised me when it came and when it came to be. So um, I think it was a, a combination of, of uh, just sort of letting go and then also really trying to plan um, and be, and be strategic. So um that's how it got done yeah. <laughs> because it was it was a, a lot to do in, in a short amount of time and what kind of um takeaway do you have you know from your experience here um you know what what did you um kind of pick up in terms of waste management uh understanding or sustainability um a sustainable materials management uh mm -hmm. processes yeah i mean i when you were um talking at that, that the last slide um what I think a lot about in my work is um, a sense of care. Like, how do we how do we take care of uh, our earth? How do we take care of each other? Um, how are we being more generous and generative? And I feel like that's what I really took away from from um, the folks at Spartan Surplus is a sense of care, um, because it isn't easy to um, to to. It's so much easier just to throw stuff away and not have to deal with it, but to have a sense of care um, in, in these objects and seeing their potential. I think um, it, that, that takes a lot of resources, um, mindfulness uh, to, to do that work. Um, and so that's what I sort of um, took away from that. So 
I, I think a lot about how are we sort of individually taking care of our place, our places, and then for, for the surplus center to sort of take that care like university wide, um, I think is a matter of scale, right? And I think that's so important. Um, so that's, that's what I, I think, I learned a lot, but that's one I think really key important thing. Yeah, I think it's nice that you point that out. I mean, because of the sheer volume of material that we receive, especially now that um, a lot of people are working from home or, per, you know, people are purging things and our um, surplus store um, staff, you know, are receiving tons and tons of material, trying to find a place for it, trying to find a way to market it, a use for it. And then, of course, helping people, um, you know, load it into their cars. You know, I remember Riley helped you load into uh, your car the shelf. So a lot of these things do take the care that, you know, hey, we don't want to drop it. We don't want to bust it. But then also, <laughs> how can we care for this in the long term um, by keeping it within, you know, circulation? So a couple other questions um, have come in and I will also just um, be mindful of time. And so I wanted to um, say thank you to everybody and drop in, we'll, we'll take these questions now, but I wanna, um, whoever has to leave, I wanted to drop in um, this information. Uh, this is a website link or a link if you wanna sign up for our newsletter. And also this is the coupon code for uh, the town hall, um, uh, as an appreciation for attending. So this is ballot at the surplus store through December 22nd. So if you wanna flip the next slide, please Meg, um, that has the coupon code on it as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so yes, thank you to everybody. And um, we have a couple questions that we can answer right now and happy to stay on uh, as, as these come in. The first one comes from Mike. Um, uh, Meg, do you have open studio hours? Um, I don't have open studio hours, but I'm also really, I, I included my website and my Instagram um, and am happy to, you know, invite people into the studio. Um, also, you know, do workshops, paper making workshops kind of around town um, and at my studio and stuff. And so if you follow me, I definitely post about those things. So um, for people that are interested, um, if I'm able to, to do that, then I'm happy to. Uh, so great. And I will um, make a um, shout out for an event that's happening at the Broad Art Lab on December 4th. It's a paper making workshop that uh, Meg is uh, spearheading. And um, I think it's from one to four. So I'll, I'll find the link and drop that in the chat as well. Um, and I put your Instagram in there and your website was dropped in earlier uh, in the chat. Um, let's see, another question is um, from Keen. It's a, he said, this has been great in the spirit of the idea of materials and items living on beyond us and beyond our initial, initial usage, what will become of the materials in your exhibit after it closes? Will it live on in a different space? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And I see that Vicki also kind of has the same yes. question. Um, so I, I really love, and this is something, part of the reason why I started working with um, invasive plants to make paper, because I was trying to really think about like, what is the, what is, I love making objects, but like, what is their life cycle, right? And so using this unwanted material to make paper that then I can actually just throw back in the ground and it becomes compost, like that's pretty cool, right? Um, so, but I still make installations that, that um, can't or won't be thrown away because there's zip ties and, and um, machines and all that sort of stuff. So. Um, even in this exhibit, I like to reuse um, parts of installations, exhibits, and create new objects with them. And so um, I could see, I mean, if these objects live on in a different exhibition or I, I reformat them to create something new, um, that's something that I really, that's really important to me. Um, like, for example, the, the cellulose circle piece, um, the, the lighting in that, that's LED lighting that I've used um, <laughs> a bunch of times in different exhibitions. And so I really try to be mindful about um, about that, um, and sort of think about these these bits and pieces of exhibitions in new in new ways and and implement them into to new ways of working. So um, I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen at the in January um, exactly, but but I can see the, the the works and the pieces and the materials becoming part of something new and different. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. And then, um, yeah, I mean, that's a great question because, right, I mean, we, we work with the materials and then we want to make sure that we can handle them in a sustainable manner. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, here at the uh, Surplus from Recycling Center with our education um, center, you know, uh, any any ways that we can, you know, show people um, the the reuse is is wonderful. We have a couple um, sculptures up right now from uh, that typically are there um, from an artist, uh, Chakia Booker, made from all um, different tire 
um, and other type of like rubber material, um, wall hangings that were also in an exhibit at the Broad, um, Interstates of the Mind. And then we also have, you know, some of these um, interesting bucket uh, formatted uh, heads that have been made by our um, uh, partnership with the Residential College of Arts and Humanities, specifically Professor Steve Byback, um, who leads Reclamation Studio. And I look forward to um, hosting a talk with him about that um, and our partnership um, later on. So um, uh, let's see, we've got a comment from Vince. Uh, he says, this is more of a comment. When I think of Meg's work, I'm reminded of something the critic Roberta Smith said about Robert Rauschenberg which is taking the refuse of the world into the refuge of art. That's a beautiful quote. Yeah. Thank you, Vince. I appreciate that. Yeah. And I believe that is all the questions that are coming in. So um, thank you all so much for attending. And we hope that this was inspiring to you. Um, enjoy that coupon for the surplus store. Hopefully you'll find something to uh, reuse as is or you know, creatively repurpose. And be sure to check out our Spartan Upcycle Nook as well. Um, we do have that open within the surplus store. And so we have a few items online also currently. So I'm gonna put that in the chat and then um, a web page, just a little bit more about Spartan Upcycle um, and uh, kind of the, um, the ethos behind um, that program. Uh, so just keep in touch with us as much as you'd like and major um, thank you and kudos to Meg for all of your hard work. And also, like you said, a shout out to everyone at the Broad Art Lab for making this possible and uh, to the Surplus Room Recycling Center for helping to make it a, a, a feasible project. Yeah, and thank you for everyone being here too. Appreciate it. All right, everyone, um, have a lovely day and we will uh, catch you next time. Take care.